the committee advises government and the prime minister on processes and procedures for the maintenance of high standards across the whole of public life. Uh, we're not a regulator and we don't look at casework, but we do look at the overall systems and the way in which those function within the UK. Uh, we are very pleased to have with us for this afternoon's session, Professor Matthew Flinders, who is from the University of Sheffield and is the founding director of the Sir Bernard Crick Centre for the Public Understanding of Politics, and Dr. Hannah White, who is the deputy director of the Institute for Government. Uh, 25 years ago, just over 25 years ago, Lord Nolan, the first chairman of this committee, uh, set down the seven principles of public life. And two years ago, this committee commissioned some academic work to look at the tapestry of standards bodies that have grown up in recent years and the recent decades uh, to look at standards in a variety of parts of public life. And building on that, the purpose of our current inquiry is to review the overall uh, effectiveness of the system that the UK now operates and specifically to identify areas where there may need to be recommendations for improvement and areas of best practice. We're going very shortly to go on to, into questions, but we have from the committee side uh, today, uh, three of our independent members, uh, Dr. Jane Martin, Dame Shirley Pierce, and Manisha Shah. We also have political members, but unfortunately other demands mean that they can't be with us for this particular session. I think I can then say a big welcome to uh, Matthew Flinders and Hannah White, Thank you very much indeed for being with us. And I'd like to start, if I may, with the, the seven principles. Uh, and to what extent do you think that ethical standards as articulated by the seven principles of public life have been coming under pressure in the past few years, as some commentators have suggested? Uh, perhaps Dr. White, would you like to start on that? And then we'll come to Professor Flinders. Yes, thank you. And thank you very much for inviting um, me here today to talk to you. Um, I think it's, it's really obvious that the Brexit created sort of circumstances that put, that put pressure on many elements of our political system. And I think inevitably that included the standard system. Um, and there were a number of reasons for that. It was because it was an issue which cut across party lines. And it meant that at a time when we had governments with small or no majorities in the House of Commons and politics was being operated against extreme time pressure, the time pressure of Article 50, the po politics became very complicated. And I think that what that meant was that loyalty to um, or you know, enthusiasm for a, a certain uh, side of the debate um, or support for a particular individual who was um, uh, supporting a side of the debate became, for some people, more important than upholding of standards. Um, and we saw that on a number of occasions. We saw um, uh, two members of parliament, Charlie Elphick, Andrew Griffiths, who'd had the whip suspended for standards related matters, who had that restored just in time for them to vote on a, in a vote of confidence, where I think that's a sort of a, a, a clear indication of, the, of the, the politics and the standards issues becoming unhelpfully um, connected. Um, we saw uh, language used in the House of Commons, which I, I know your committee has thought a lot about um, pressure um, and, and abuse online of, of, um, of, of, of members um, of parliament and, and, and people in political life generally. Um, and you know, I think we saw language used in the House of Commons, which deliberately um, uh, raised tensions around um, around Brexit in a way which um, you know the evidence is uh, really led to increased um, online abuse of, of members of Parliament. Um, and then you know we had you know even a member of your own committee, um, they, they, they Margaret Beckett, explicitly say that she felt that a standards issue, um, uh, the the issue of, of allegations that had been made against the Speaker of the House of Commons um, in relation to, to the bullying and harassment scandal that, that, that occurred, um, that on some occasions, some issues were more important than bad behaviour. And that was, you know, a very um, explicit um, and honest articulation of the difficulty for many politicians 
um, in balancing um, their political role and, and standards issues at, at, at times like this. And I think it was a really, it was a really um, explicit sort of um, uh, noticeable um, um, moment that, that that was something that there were standards issues which couldn't be dealt with adequately in a political environment. Um, because of the of the of the um, of the Brexit issue, which was being dealt with at the time, um, coronavirus similarly has um, created a sort of state of exception in many ways. Um, it's created that in relation, you know, because again of the time pressure and the life and death nature um, of the of the um, pandemic. Um, it's entirely understandable that um, you know some things have been. Um, uh, some uh, some norms that we would normally expect to be uh, adhered to have been um, not adhered to. So in relation to things like procurement, public appointments, um, we've also seen not a standards issue, but you know lots of use of emergency legislation and so on in Parliament. Those things have been necessary to some degree, but I think it's really important that when we relax rules, we also think about how. Uh, we restore them afterwards. And there's a real danger both in relation to Brexit and coronavirus that um, things which happen in an emergency for situation for reasons that seem to be explicable at the time become a habit. Um, and I think that's the thing which we, we need to guard against at this time. And I, I think we need to, we mustn't pretend that these aren't political choices. Um, you know, yes, in relation to coronavirus, as I say, is, there are real life and death issues. But Brexit was important though it seemed at the time and is and seems you know it was not a life and death issue it was a political question it was a question about our trading relationship with other countries and actually i think um personally speaking that you know the standards issues are about the whole health of our political system and whether the public has trust in our political system and it's it's really important for politicians to, to sort of bear that in mind when they think that a temporary suspension of the rules or you know, an exception to the rules um, is, is justifiable in a particular situation. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Flinders. So ethical standards, have they come under increased pressure in recent years? Well, um, my broad answer would be yes, and I would agree with many of the issues that Dr. White has raised. I suppose what's also interesting is the need to just stand back a little. I mean, I've been involved with the committee since it was first established in the mid 1990s and it's clear that you do get an ebb and a flow and cycles peaks and troughs of public concern and and I suppose the thing that I'm interested in is 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 there something exceptional about now that distinguishes it from that normal pattern of public disengagement concern frustration and I would say that that, that yes there is something exceptional about where we are right now. I think uh, Brexit and Covid have exerted greater pressure on the system. Governing under pressure is hard, um, but there are two elements I would just add to Covid and, and Brexit. The first is the role of the media, I think, has increasingly changed in such a way that the public's perception of the existence and uphold of ethical standards might be out of kilter with the reality. I'm fairly confident that on a global comparative level, British politics and governance is pretty good. Now that isn't the impression that you'll get from the media because the media believes that only bad news sells. So when there is uh, a breach of the, the regulatory framework, that will become the whole news and nothing else. So I'm not sure that a free media should automatically be judged as always a good thing. And, and the second thing is that the social context in which politics is happening in the UK and around, and I think this is really important, there is now a certain kudos in breaking the rules, in exhibiting bad behaviour and offensive language in a way that simply wasn't there in the past. This is linked to populism, it's linked to apathy, but for the first time ever in British political history, I would say that actual, actually being blamed and bad manners can be for some politicians a good thing. And it's that shift that is really worrying me. 
What do you do? You think that those are linked issues in terms of media coverage? Why? Why is why are bad? Why is bad behaviour now a selling point rather than a vulnerability in your view? For, for some think, politicians. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, if you look at the data on public attitudes to politics, political institutions, and political processes, um, that data in the UK is pretty devastating. It's very, very poor. It appears that there is a large number of people, sections of society, that really do feel completely disenfranchised from the system. If you have a, a large number of people that feel angry and frustrated and that the system is weighed against them, then suddenly having politicians that come in who are willing to break the rules to offend conventions is a performance by those politicians that we are difficult, we're different, we are not like them, you can trust us. It's a way of funneling and inflaming public anxieties that are already there. So, uh, you know, when we have a very exceptional prime minister at the moment, let me stop. There is a very good piece of work by Lord Peter Hennessy, which I, you may be aware of, called Good Chaps No More, in which he talks about British politics being defined by the notion of the good chaps theory of government. That has been the essence of our ethical framework that our politicians will know at which point to withdraw if the alarm goes off. Whether we still have good chaps that abide by those rules of the game that are based upon self-control I think that is the exceptional shift that has occurred and it is not just in the UK but it is being seen in the UK as well. How far do you think the perception that um, the media are sort of stoking mistrust in a sense is a is balanced by the fact that the fear of exposure has always traditionally and to a significant extent still is one of the factors that encourages people not to break the rules and i think one can see you could cite examples of that you know even in relatively recent periods yes you're absolutely correct the the, the difference you're you're highlighting is almost the difference between positive skepticism which is good in democracy and corrosive destructive nihilism now what I think we're almost moving to a system of is that some of the people that we expect to work within politics are so scared of being caught out and shamed publicly that they aren't willing to even work within the system that's provided for them and that is fine. So if I give you a very simple example of this, if you take the absolute bullying and public shaming that some MPs have taken in just the last week, about how they have spent the technology allowance from IPSA to buy keyboards to take part in a digital parliament, it was impossible for the anybody, and I tried, to break through a media wall that this was another MP's expenses scandal snouts in the trough. And any serious argument that there was a major scandal, that there is a debate about MP's expenses, but we are not in the same time as a, the MP's expenses, was impossible to even cultivate a conversation. And, and, and why that matters is because we have lots of very good men and women in politics who are now too scared to claim their legitimate expenses for fear of them being the ones that are picked up, shamed and abused. And then that will just lead to a two-tier political system where the people we really need in politics who don't come from moneyed backgrounds don't go into politics. Could I, sorry, uh, Dr. White, you wanted to come back on that? Just a small point to say that I think that the, the part of the problem in relation to the media is, is the black and white nature of it, or, or of, the, of the judgments that are made. And I think that this is something that we need to reflect on in relation to standard systems, because the, the sort of the attitude of, of the media is in relation to any breach, you must be fine. Um, and actually, it's much more constructive, I think, to, to think about, you know, systems in which there are a range of sanctions for different, you know, levels of, 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 of offence, as it were, 
Um, and I think it's that it's that level of, of nuance which is l lost via the sort of strident media coverage, which makes it so difficult, which creates this sort of culture of fear that Matthew's talking about. Moving on from that particular area, how far do you think that an elect, a person in elected role, who is therefore directly accountable to the, their electorate, should be uh, subject to a separate, as it were, external ethical framework, or should we rely on the good sense and insight of the voter to uh, bring that accountability? Perhaps uh, Dr. White, you might like to start on that one. So I think, I mean, there, there are various different ways you can come at that question. One is that I think, you know, there should always be a broad ethical framework in which all elected um, politicians are, are operating. Um, and I think that the Nolan principles are a terrific sort of boon that the UK has, that there is a sort of agreed set of sort of common sense um, standards. Um, but I think then it depends on the nature of the issue. So it seems to me that there are some, um, some sorts of um, activities which elected um, uh, politicians engage in, which are matters which are, you know, should be subject to rules and ethical rules. And you know, that for too long, there was an assumption that um, there were, uh, matters, you know, the most matters, because of the exclusive cognizance of, of Parliament over its own affairs, there were matters which only politicians should um, determine for other politicians. And I think it, it's, a, it's a good thing that following the expenses scandal, you know, there were a set of rules in, in place in relation to financial management. That's, that's just, you know, that's not something which is to do with the democratic mandate given to, to members. They, they, they receive public money, they ought to follow the right rules. And I'm also pleased that in relation to, to um, the following the bullying scandal, which happened recently in Parliament, that the that, that normal sort of HR standards are now sort of seen as something which um, that politicians should follow. On the other hand, there are matters which are more related to, to, to politics and political judgment. Um, and that's where we get to the sort of ministerial code and so on, where I think um, it, it's less clear cut. Um, and the decisions about whether uh, MP should continue to serve the Prime Minister in his cabinet, um, in my view, couldn't be made by anyone other than the Prime Minister. So I think, you know, there's there's the broad framework, but then you have to look in detail at, at, at what the thing is that the person is being regulated for doing. Thank you. Professor Flinders? I, I would come at the whole issue about ethics and accountability through the notion of a, an, an ecosystem in that just because you're elected, it, it doesn't give you carte blanche to act in any way you want until the next election in terms of it's the ends justify the means. In fact, as most political systems work, it will be the the combined effect of a whole number of different activities and processes working together and if you get one part of that ecosystem that fails it's very easy for the whole system then to start to break down so yes you know the electorate can hold their politicians to account at the next general election we have uh, a parliament which can hold the government to account to some extent but that in itself needs to be layered with a more sophisticated tapestry i think was a word lord evans used at the beginning the, the issue with the tapestry that we have created, and it has been transformational over the last 25 years, and it goes back to something that Dr. White just said, is that um, it was incredibly amateurish. And in some areas it still is. And the bullying in, in the House of Commons and House of Lords has led to what is actually an incredible incredibly simplistic introduction of fairly basic HR processes. But the system itself is still overall quite soft. It lacks a hard edge. And I think that's maybe what's come out most recently. So could I, before I hand on to colleagues, in the light of you know, what's been being said so far, how do you think our existing regulatory system is working? How effective is it uh, in comparison with the challenges that it faces? Perhaps we'll start with uh, Professor Flinders and then ask Dr White to comment. Well, 
I'm not going to win any popularity points with the British public or the media, but I would dare to suggest that it actually works far well than most people realise. Our regulatory framework is generally part of the hidden wiring. I'm sorry to keep repeating uh, Peter Hennessy, but it really is part of our hidden wiring. It makes the system work, but generally it doesn't attract a lot of attention, and, and nor should it. This has served us well in terms of it's been flexible, it's been adaptable, typically British and organic. But I suppose it, whether it is kept pace with the changing nature of society in quite the way it needs to is something that I'm not sure about. And I suppose the question I have lurking in my head is that our hidden wiring might need to be given slightly more um, visibility and a slightly stronger voice. Dr. White. So I, I agree with, with much of that. Um, I do think that in common with the British constitution, the, the, the standard system, uh, as Professor Flinders says, has, has accreted over time, um, mostly in response to the last scandal which means it can be very good at fighting, you know, at, at combating whatever the last scandal was. But that doesn't mean that there's necessarily an overall sort of planned sense in which um, it, it can be forward looking and anticipate the challenges which are, are, are coming down the track. It tends to be a reactive rather than proactive. Um, I think it is, having worked within it, unhelpfully complex. It is really difficult for people to know where to go, uh, who to ask. Um, and if they have a standards issue to raise, how to do that most effectively. Um, I, I spent a lot of time working in different parts of, of, of Parliament and, and indeed for your committee, at redirecting members of the Parliament, uh, members of the public who were asking, you know, how to raise something that they that they um, wanted to talk about. So I think that is problematic. Some areas are better developed than others. Um, some are more sort of modern than others. Um, and I think there is this continuing um, uh, tension between principles and rules and, and, and where each is most appropriate. And again, in common with many other aspects of the, the British political system, the exact way in which a regulator gets set up, the moment it gets set up, depends on a whole range of factors and not necessarily factors related to how it is best suited, you know, what, what the long term um, best um, aspects are to make it the most effective body. Um, so I think that it, there's a quite a lot of inconsistency which um, would benefit from being um, simplified, both from the point of view of the public and those working within the system. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Jane Martin. Um, uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I, I'd like to focus us down a little more now um, on um, what we're talking about really is, you know, as part of our review, is ethical standards for good government. So, you know, uh, executive accountability, uh, if you like, for standards. Um, and um, as I'm sure both of you are completely aware, you know, most of the levers for executive ethical standards regulation are in the hands of government, uh, usually quite rightly so. Um, so, you know, this is starting us to think about, well, what is the role for parliamentary accountability? And I know, Matthew, for example, it's something that you've taken a particular interest in. So uh, I've got two questions, which I'll just put together and then we can perhaps unpack them. But, you know, the first really is simply, well, you know, we've got a system which has some advisory bodies, some semi-independent regulators. Um, ministers are still accountable to the House, of course, uh, as is a PM. And um, what role does parliamentary accountability and executive play in standards regulation as part of that? Perhaps I should use the word ecosystem. Um, and sort of aligned with that, you know, do you think that Parliament should have greater oversight of this regulation, given some of the, you know, the weaknesses that are being highlighted? I've got plenty of supplementaries to that, but those are the sort of, those are the, the two headlines. And I wonder if, Matthew, you would have a go at it first. Uh, blimey, yes, I will do. There's a, lot, <laughs> there's a lot going on there to unpack. But I okay. think the, um, the simple question, or the one way of looking at this is there is a certain notion of a, a trap here that the vast majority of our mechanisms either directly or indirectly lead back to the government of the day, the executive, and therefore to the prime minister. And if the prime minister as 
he or she is usually able to can control their majority in the house, then everything sort of fizzles out and falls apart at the final stage. So how we actually circumnavigate that issue around meaningful reform in a constitutional logic process would require the prime minister to support reform that will inevitably make his or her life harder. And that's the Turkish Christmas issue that we've been around many times. However, there is, I think, also out there within society, within parliament, an understanding that something isn't working as it should be at the moment. And the moral fiber of the constitution has been stretched to its malleability limit and may well be snapped. One way of just thinking about this, and I am doing a dangerous thing of thinking off the top of my head, oh. is that in many ways, the role of the constitutional watchdogs and regulators are to act as fire alarms. They are the fire alarms that go off to inform Parliament that something is going wrong. I think that one of the issues might be that the connection between the fire alarms and the parliamentary response is often too opaque, slow and lacking in zap, if that's a phrase I can use formally. Um, and I've forgotten the other thing I was going to say, but yeah, the fire alarms, I think, is a really good way of looking at it. What we've created is a whole range of fire alarms of different size, different power. They go off, but does anything actually happen in Parliament? And I think too often, as, uh, as Dr White said, the problem is that the, the, the executive's grip of the system allows it to dilute down any real impact or control when it gets into the house. Ah, yes. But the thing I was going to say about the fire, fire alarm is that maybe what we could think about collectively is one reform, which I think has always been overlooked, is the power of voice. It isn't about giving the regulatory bodies more formal constitutional powers, but it might be about giving them more voice to engage with the public and therefore bring pressure on the government indirectly, which wouldn't fundamentally mess up the constitutional structures. I've always been maddened, probably why I've got no hair left, by IPSA and the Electoral Commission, who have no formal statutory role to promote public understanding about what they do or why it matters, and that all MPs aren't on the take, and that all elections aren't rigged. You know, if, if these regulators had more of a public duty, I think change could happen. That would increase the anticipatory influence on our politicians. Can I just stick with, with Matthew for a moment? Uh, because, I mean, you, you've done work on uh, select committees, for example, haven't you? And, and uh, PACAC, I think, in particular. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm just thinking of that as an example of, uh, you know, what, certainly what I would term as parliamentary accountability. You know, it's part of the, it's, it's a part of the toolkit. Um, and certainly we've heard from other um, contributors thus far in this review that, you know, thinking carefully about, you um, uh, and properly about executive authority, the, exec the authority of the prime minister in particular, which is absolutely right in, in particular cases, uh, you know, it's his cabinet, they're his ministers, etc. But that there might be or there should be greater accountability for the decisions he or she might take, uh, you know, i.e. accountability to parliament. So it's wrapped up in the same thing. I just wondered if from your research you had anything further you, you could help us with on that. Well, two things on that. First of all, select committees are a core element of that ecosystem. Select committees often get a bad rap, and yet they do an incredible amount. Most of the select committee's work takes place off stage. So yeah. it's influence, control, accountability, which is very hard to target or read within the reports. But that doesn't mean it isn't having an influence within the corridors and, and the offices in, in Westminster and Whitehall. The other interesting thing is that in recent years, select committees have had some significant success in engaging and stimulating the public and pulling them back into some commitment to our established parliamentary processes. It's not that the public aren't interested in politics or are necessarily apathetic. It's more close to the truth to say they no longer understand how the system works or where to go to help play a role. And I mean, the, the, the landscape review that um, 
uh, Rebecca Dobson uh, Phillips did, I thought was excellent. But it's 60 pages of pretty intense, you know, you, you, you've got to have a pretty good political literacy to even start to know how to navigate that terrain. Sure. The link with select uh, committees, I, I, I don't think we should always think about ethics and accountability as necessarily going upwards to the no. chain through parliament ministers that way. Yeah. I think there might be an innovative space that we haven't thought about, which yeah. is about the broader ecosystem and facilitating a broader connection between that ethical framework and the public more directly. Sure, sure. And so just finally, because I, I mean, I just, just as a too good an opportunity since we've got you here on, on this. And then, but uh, uh, so would you be, you know, do you think there is an opportunity? Would you be in favour of, do you think it would be a good thing if we thought harder about some of the greater oversight and regulation that came through Parliament? On, the, on that basis precisely, because you want to get through to the public and the MPs are representatives of the public after all. And, you know, so is there an opportunity there just to sort of try to nail it? Yes, I suppose what I'm trying to be here is, is very honest about the raw politics here. Yes. I know, yes. I know Boris, I know the system. If the executive sense a threat within the established framework, it will close it down. Yeah. Okay. However, if you think more indirectly and innovatively about bringing the public into the process, yeah. I think that wouldn't be interpreted as so obvious a threat. OK, thank you. Sorry, Hannah, I've, I've kept you waiting a rather long time. Sorry. Um, I, uh, lots of different issues to pick up there. I mean, I think um, building on something that uh, Professor Flinders said earlier, I think the select committee system is um, is a very positive um, mechanism within the standards system um, and more so than in many other parliaments because select committees are genuinely have a sense of their independence more in Westminster than they do in most of the parliaments and they are capable of disagreeing with government and even when they have a government majority which most of them do um, I think parliament's main role is about visibility um, and that's via select committees um, picking up on these issues, but that can be quite um, uh, sporadic. Uh, depends what else is going on at the time, what issues get picked up and don't. So it, it can be a bit hit and miss. Um, but the other role, of course, uh, of Parliament can be in the chamber. Um, and we've had good innovations recently in terms of, well, not that recently, but um, uh, in, in relation to sort of topical questions, um, more use of emergency debates and so on. So if there is an issue which has been raised, which has been flagged by the fire alarm, um, you know, that can be picked up um, in Parliament and discussed. And I think that that visibility side, you know, it's obviously the Nolan principle of, of, of greater openness around these issues um, can be really valuable. Um, I do think there's a question, though, which relates back to, you know, the inevitability of, of how, um, you know, different parliaments are different after each election in each situation. You have different majorities. You have have different political situations. And is it right um, that um, the extent to which there is public you know, visibility for standards issues is dependent on the size of the majority in the House? Um, or whether you have a, a weak or a strong opposition and these sorts of things. And that's why I think I'd go back to Professor Flinder's point about um, uh, standards regulators needing to have uh, the sort of power to, to, to publish and to, to sort of say what they think openly. Um, because if they can't you know, attract attention via parliament for whatever reason, then they need to try to, to, to be able to do that in other ways. Um, thinking about some of the specific sort of standards um, regulators and so on, I mean, I, I do think potentially um, that, that there could be a valuable role in relation to ACABA, um, the Advisory Committee on Business Appointments, um, having some kind of um, a, a parliamentary outlet um, for its findings, because I do think um, it seems to be genuinely ex accepted that its influence is, is weak, and I wonder whether uh, the prospect of um, of of its um, its thoughts being aired on a parliamentary stage might 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 give it some some strength. Um, in relation to something like um, sort of the, the 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 prime minister's advisor um, on the ministerial code, um, I think you know it has to be for the prime minister to to oversee the code, 
But again, I think potentially, you know, if the advisor was able to report directly to Parliament, um, if he were or she were the independent advisor on the ministerial code, not the prime minister's independent advisor, then that would um, be beneficial in terms of a sense of the actual independence of the role. And it would still be for the prime minister to make the final decision on who should stay in their cabinet or not. Um, but the evidence base of the inquiry on which, you know, they were making their decision could then be in the public domain. And I think that would be really good for public confidence. Thank you very much. I think I'll leave it there because that does rather take us on, I think, to the next area of questioning. Thank you very much. I think to Dame Shirley. Yes, thank you very much, uh, both of you. Really interesting discussion. And you've talked, both of you, about um, the complexity, the tapestry, um, to use that term, and the sort of evolutionary nature of it that we get good at um, responding to the last crisis. Um, but we can't always anticipate that that's what it's going to be. Uh, the next crisis is going to be the content of that. So I'm interested in your um, uh, more theoretical view, really, of what an ideal standards regulator ought to look like and whether we, if, if we were starting from scratch, if we were wanting to make some radical recommendations about changing the landscape, what would be the essence of a standards regulator that we would have to make absolutely sure was there? Um, and could you have that applying to the breadth of different um, environments in which standards matter? Um, or is there a really big difference between um, ministerial appointments and other standards in government? Um, should we start with Professor Flinders? Sure, so um, I suppose in many ways, looking at the landscape for ethical regulation is in many ways quite similar to the evolution of British local government over the last hundred years or so. In that if you were to be able to sort of clean the states and start from scratch, you would never ever create the multiple layered of administrative accretion and sedimentation that we've allowed to build up and create such complexity. So I think if we were to start again, we would build engineer a much simpler system but there wouldn't be in in my thoughts any one size fits all regulatory body i think that what we would be able to have is a set of core principles about the role and standards and appointment of those regulatory bodies and it was those principles that were carried across in different shape and form to different parts of our constitutional configuration What's interesting, and again, it's really great, Dr. White, and I haven't set this up, but, but we are helping each other raise issues here, is, is, is Dr. White raised the, um, the issue about um, history and, and how things have grown up in a very uh, complicated manner. Um, but, it, oh yeah, so the, the thing is, if we were to start putting in this new system in different areas, so for example, suggesting that areas that are currently sitting under the ethical control of the prime minister start such as a, a cobra or the uh, the ministerial code advisor and saying that they should become more parliamentary almost uh, recommending a move a shift across my fear is that all that would do is increase the executive's commitment to using the offstage normal channels to influence who got those roles and so a really important question concerning all of this is who regulates the regulators and most importantly who appoints them and it's something we might come on to but the the hollowing out of the public appointment system that we'd put in place is risks really undermining confidence in the whole system at root. Um, I suppose the flip side, again, I'm just slightly cautious about just throwing the question back to the committee about oversteer. The system isn't fundamentally broken and the right tone tends to come from the top in terms of ethical regulation. If we had a different prime minister or we thought about previous prime ministers, they would very likely set a very different tone, which 
people who are sensitive within the system would pick up. And the system does have a great capacity for realigning that we don't want to overlook or miss. Mm. It, it's just under a very particular strain at a very particular moment now. Mm. Okay, thank you. Dr. White. So it, it's a really overwhelming thought, I think, to think <laughs> how you could be radical in this space. Um, because there are so many considerations and there is so much history and this is the thing that always prevents the really radical answer. And I guess one way to think about it is what, what you're missing um, by not having a radical answer and a radical answer, I guess, in this, in this um, case, some kind of, as you say, overarching um, standards apparatus, which um, would bring greater coherence and less um, complexity to, to the system. Um, and I guess I think there are probably sort of three main things you, you, you miss without that there. You miss um, a body that has an ability to um, constantly range across the, the landscape, looking at pressures and, um, and, and, and opportunities, I guess, and best practice and so on, and how that can be replicated. CSPL, obviously, you know, you're doing this review now. It's something that you can do um, sometimes, but it's not a, something you're resourced to do on a, on a permanent basis. So there's that kind of um, sort of detailed standards monitoring on an ongoing basis, which, which you, you might get with that sort of body. Um, there's, a, the, there's then a sense of um, a way in which a body like that could prioritise resources. So rather than having a fixed set of, of bodies um, whose um, uh, budgets and resourcing are very much determined by, um, by the government, largely speaking, um, not in all cases, uh, but you would have a sort of centralised point which was able to look at you know, where the, the points of most pressure were and, and, and allocate attention accordingly. Um, and also, but perhaps most importantly, I think the third thing that you, you would get is, is a body which was really able to think proactively about standards um, challenges coming down the track. And here I'm thinking about, you know, the sorts of things which are very much in, in discussion, but, you know, how does, um, you know, how do the big data ethics questions, um, you know, affect, you know, the whole gamut of, of, of ethical um, standards, you know, social media, all those sorts of things. Now, these are things which obviously, you know, your committee is able, is able to touch on, but as I say, it's not able to, um, really sort of transfer best practice across the piece in the way that a, a sort of a, an overarching body would be which had responsibilities across these different um uh, across these different arenas um but as 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 professor flinders has said nothing ever happens in the standards landscape really unless there is an incentive for the uh, executive to to do something about it and that normally means um, you know, a major, a major scandal of some sort, and that normally leads to, you know, a very specific intervention which is going to deal with that. So I think it's probably, you know, it's unrealistic to think that you um, might move to a, a, a system, you know, closer to sort of say what Canada has with, uh, you know, more of an overarching ethical, ethical regulator. So I think, um, practically speaking, we're, we're probably talking, you know, more about how to regularize and and improve the models that we have and there i think i'm sorry i'm talking for a long time but the, the key things i think i would say in terms of sort of characteristics of effective regulators and i think that it does vary a bit depending on what you're regulating but you need a high degree of independence you need uh the sort of person leading the body appointed through an open process preferably with parliamentary involvement uh, some kind of pre-appointment hearing. I mean, you don't need to go as far as sort of the, the OBR type, you know, parliamentary sign-off, um, but some kind of parliamentary vo uh, involvement, uh, preferably uh, powers established in statute, clearly defined powers. So uh, preferably you would want regulators to be able to initiate investi investigations, to publish their findings, to be... Um, uh, uh, promised a response from government to, to, the, to those reports. Um, in some cases, you would want them to have sanctions 
as IPSA does and, and so on. You would want them then to, to operate it in a consistent way, with a consistent methodology, you know, what they do pick up, what they don't pick up, and above all, they need to be properly resourced. That would be my kind of um, overall recipe for an effective regulator. So those both those responses are really helpful. Um, and I um, I take absolutely the message about realism. Um, uh, but we do also have to recognize, and, and my question to you, how the current system um, has some confidence from the public. Is it, it, it at what point or at what point do, do we get concerned about the public confidence in the existing system to motivate people to, um, uh, to ask the questions, how can we introduce more of the criteria that you've just described into what's already there. So it's sort of titrating what we've got with, with where we want to be. And um, do you think the system at the moment has enough public confidence in it for us to just tweak the edges? Or have we really reached a point where we need to be a bit more aggressive with some of the criteria that you've just outlined, Dr. White, before, even if we can't start from scratch from, from improving some of the bits that we've already got? If I ask you first and then come to, to Professor Flinders. Yeah, so I guess um, there, there's two different ways to come into, aren't there? So, you know, it, it, I guess I think you're asking, you know, at what point does public concern get high enough that there's that you reach the sort of um, the, the point at which you can motivate people to act, um, which is um, which is probably, again, right and realistic, although, you know, it would be nicer to think about the benefits you would gain from greater trust in the system also being part of the um, the, the sort of calculation of, of, you know, if we've seen anything from the coronavirus um, pandemic, I think it's the importance of public trust in government and public trust that the, the people who are running the system are doing so for the benefit of, um, a, a, of the whole population. And that, you know, if you compare internationally, um, you know, it's clear that in different, different political systems, you have different levels of confidence and, and different groups in society have different levels of confidence in, in government acting on their behalf. Um, so I think, um, I think that it is harder to construct the case at present that there is you know, sufficient, you know, in the absence of a scandal, it's harder to say there's a great public um, so, sort of um, pressure for this, but I think, it's almost worse. There's a sort of that it's the public apathy, the public, um, sense that actually they're all as you know they're they're all just as bad as each other. And why would I pay any attention to this? Mm -hmm. Real problem, um, which which politicians ought to be seized of, and they ought to see that the potential benefits for them and for the governing of the country um, as the prize, if you like, rather than just trying to avert the the sort of disaster of, of further declining confidence. Okay, that's really helpful. Professor Flinders. So um, I think I think one of the um, unfortunate issues around politics more broadly is that major transformational change is usually born through crises. And I wouldn't say, although lots of people are keen of saying this, that British government is in a crisis. However, what I would say is that I think we are running on vapours in terms of public confidence or malleability of the current system under the current pressures. So my fear is that it wouldn't take too many more examples of our government and particularly the prime minister refusing to play by the rules of the game as they currently exist to really set off wide ranging concern about whether we were moving towards a more serious system. Now this goes back to the, the first point and, and Dr. White's point about, from an academic perspective, the problem with our regulatory framework is that it has a hollow crown. It has lots of regulatory bodies, but it doesn't have a central brain to do that overseeing monitoring landscape horizon work. It's a bit like why UKRI was created to give that central strategic capacity to the research councils. Yeah. Now it's interesting because the government have obviously just created this regulatory horizons council and in many ways that is exactly what is needed. 
in the area of ethical regulation of government itself. It's to be more proactive and positive rather than constantly reacting when things go wrong. And again, a lot of this will be to do with framing. How do we frame this so it isn't all part of the sort of yarboo negativity and actually we sell it as a positive for British society and for the government and for everybody. And there might be an opportunity here because I don't know if you know about this, but there's a very strong case being developed for a new Institute of Regulation. Do you know about this? I don't, but I'm sure my colleagues do. Okay, well, I can let you yeah, well, we, we should find out. Perhaps I'm very conscious about the time, so perhaps that's something we could follow up with yeah, you sure. offline. Um, that would be extremely helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, both of you. I'll hand over to Manisha Shah. Good afternoon. I, I'm afraid uh, we are very short on time, and it's been a fascinating conversation. You've picked up quite a lot of the questions that I had. If I may end uh, our session with one question to you both. I mean, um, Dr. Flinders, you, uh, Professor Flinders, you said you undertook, when you undertook research on public appointments in 2015, you said uh, that, uh, I think you said that the Brit that British ministers were amongst some of the most constrained in Europe. How would you characterize the patronage powers of ministers today? Can I ask the same question of you both? Well, very simply, the British system was able to react quite well to concerns about patronage, cronyism and corruption. And it did institute a very good system of um, public appointments that were regulated, often had a role for parliament, but still allowed a role for ministers. My great, great, great concern is that, and as Peter Riddle has explained in different arenas, is that the old system of public appointments once again relied upon ministers exercising a certain level of self-restraint and buying into that system. I think what we've seen recently, and I know it's not the job of the Committee on Standards in Public Life to focus on any specific cases, but the appointment of Lord Wharton, from my perspective, was incredibly worrying because this is somebody that has absolutely no expertise or experience in higher education who's been appointed to chair the office for students. Now, how you can credibly, legitimately make the case for that public appointment, given that he was also the prime minister's campaign secretary, is very hard for me to make as a professor of the public understanding of politics to the public. Dr. White. Yes, I mean, I think um, you know, Professor Flinders is 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 really the expert here. But um, I I, th I think I agree. You know, there there are systems in place. The question is the extent to which those systems are being gradually sort of watered down. I know this is something you've spoken to um, to Riddle and and Sir David Normington about today as well. Um, and there are also areas, you know, of, of of people who receive jobs in public life, like like non executives and so on. Where, where these rules um, you know do not apply and I think there is a there's a, there's a growing swell of um, of cases which have happened under under the, the the most recent government some of which as I say very understandably in relation to in uh, coronavirus um, appointments made outside the, the normal process but others where that's that's not a not the case um, and I think that there's a risk uh, around that for the government and it and it really undermines um, you know, people who might well be the best candidate for the job, but if they're appointed in a way which um, which is is seen as questionable, then that undermines their ability to do that job that they might have done. You know, that the, they might be going to do very well, but will do less well because of the manner in which they're appointed. And is it your view that this is this is not this is this is something that has now created precedent to the extent that it cannot be rolled back? No, I think it could be. I think it could be rolled back, but it takes a very, very clear signal from the top about the rules that we are going to follow and that they are, they are non-negotiable. At the moment, the traditional flexibility of the British Constitution that we've always held so dear and has served us well is almost being abused, not for public benefit, 
but for very narrow party partisan interests. And the worst thing is that the public are increasingly aware of this. And that it's not just about the people that get the public appointment, it's the greater number of people that I'm working with in South Yorkshire and the Midlands, people that would go for public appointments, but are now not willing to go because they say, I'm not gonna get the job because we've got gone back to the old world. The last word is yours, Dr. White. No, I don't think I have anything to add to that. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much indeed, um, Chair. That was all my questions. Thank you very much, Manisha. And thank you very much indeed, Professor Flinders and Dr. White. That was extremely helpful. The fact that we have run into the buffers in terms of time actually is a demonstration of how interesting your contributions have been. And we're very grateful for your help this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.